you know, edit it. No, we just. <laughs> No, it's it's just we just uh, pass okay. on the whole thing. It's, this is a very amateurish kind of thing. But let, let me just start uh, with a little introductory remark here. Uh, this is Monday, June sixteenth, two thousand and three. Today's interview with Korean War veteran Robert Sardo is taking place at his home at seven five fifty five No No Crest Drive in Almond, New York. Mr. Sardo is 71 years old, having been born on February 27, 1932. He served in the U.S. Navy from June 18, 1951 to June 11, 1955. My name is Marlene Zecca, and I volunteered to interview Mr. Sardo as part of the Veterans History Project. I am also serving as the camera operator today. Okay, that takes care of the formalities. <laughs> so, if we could start. Well, it all began. Uh, At actually, the beginning. <laughs> actually, uh, and I got to say this, uh, it happened in, uh, when I was going to Alfred University, actually, State, uh, it was Alfred State. Mm -hmm. Right after I got out of high school in 1950, I, I spent a year at Alfred which is only about six miles from here. Mm -hmm. At that time, funny. what was your hometown? Elmira. Elmira. I was born and raised in Elmira. Okay. So uh, when I uh, was going through there, I had learned math for the first time. After struggling with it in high school, I learned math. And, and the reason I, I mentioned this is because uh, during that time at Alfred, uh, it was, it was the, right after the Korean War broke out, which uh, was in June of 1950. And I started Alfred in September that year. Mm -hmm. But uh, and during that uh, year that I was there, the, uh, the draft board was very active, and you could get a student. You could get a student uh, uh, exemption. But uh, one night, after a couple of glasses of beer, we tried to take a sample test that they sent us, and uh, we didn't do too well because I'm pretty sure it was the beer that was reacting. <laughs> So that scared me, and I thought, boy, when this when the school year is up, I'm going to have to uh, decide whether I was going to enlist or let the Army take me. Right. Well, that turned out to be a no-brainer. I decided to enlist. But as I said, the uh, math that I learned at Alfred really set me up, I think, mm -hmm. for the rest of my career to yeah. this day. Yeah. Uh, so if, if I could just interject, if you did not enlist, then you would have been drafted in the, and, Army. In the Army. That would have been right. the only option if you were going in as a draft. Right. Okay. Now, a lot of people chose that option because they would only be in for like two years and then they'd be out again. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at that time we had a war going on and that usually meant uh, being in the thick of things. And mm -hmm. uh, I was one of those that preferred uh, to uh, explore other ways of serving. Okay. So. When we got out of school, was uh, around the first part of June, uh, I had three dates that I could look at to go in. And I picked the 18th of June of, of the three, the middle of three uh, three weekends that I could uh, enlist. I enlisted at the old post office building on Church Street, and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, which is now <laughs> Clemens Center Parkway. Right. Uh, the, uh, so we, we we just, I, I, I called my uh, high school buddy who was in Washington, told him I was going into the Navy, and he said, hey, gee, wait for me. And so he quit his job, came up, and we enlisted together. And then uh, we uh, were sent to Bainbridge, Maryland, mm -hmm. after a brief stint in uh, Buffalo, going through the physical. Then mm -hmm. we took a train down to uh, Bainbridge, Maryland. Was this like in uh, that was a, a boot, boot camp? camp type that was a boot camp. That was a boot camp. And that boot camp had just opened. In fact, we were Company 149, so we were the 149th company uh, that uh, that uh, started uh, there. And uh, they were still uh, redoing and constructing and reconstructing and uh, refurbishing mm -hmm. a lot of the buildings. Mm -hmm. that, because the base apparently was open during the war, World War II, and then closed. Okay. And then because of the Korean conflict, that they uh, they quickly opened it up and uh, were refurbishing it when we went through. So we were there uh, 11 weeks uh, going through basic training. 
What, what did that involve? Well, can you give me a little idea what the basic training involved? Mostly about? marching. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but mostly uh, you're learning the, uh, you know, the, the Blue Jackets manual was your Bible in those days. Uh, the Blue Jacket Manual explained everything about the Navy, the history of the Navy, mm -hmm. um, the ships, the type of ships. It, it was really, uh, it was really a, a very, very uh, comprehensive course in you know the history mm -hmm. of the Navy, why the uniform, you know what the traditions were, right. and a lot of our training class revolved around you know expanding on that training of the Blue Jackets mm -hmm. Manual. We uh, were also being prepared for what was going to happen after boot camp uh, in that uh, there were uh, times when there were uh, uh, situations that came up where uh, uh, they would ask you, where do you want to go after the Navy, right. after the uh, boot camp? And so what they did is they, they had a uh, uh, lengthy uh, courses, uh, lengthy discourse on, on courses available and schools available. Uh, if you do well on, uh, on these, uh, similar to SAT tests, mm -hmm. these are tests that you had to take uh, that, uh, that believe me, when whatever mark you get, you live with the rest of it for the rest of your career. And so they had a battery of these uh, comprehensive tests that included mechanical, your, your mechanical ability, your arithmetic ability, your math ability, like aptitude your clerical, tests. Apt, these are strictly aptitude, aptitude tests, yeah. And the mark you got there, as I said, you were branded with, basically. And this is where I had Alfred to thank, is because I scored pretty high in math. And that now, opened up some doors That opened you? up doors that I wanted to open up. Good. And without that year of Alfred, I doubt if I could have qualified. But uh, I had scored pretty high in mechanical and arithmetic because I just got out of school. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that uh, enabled me to put in for aviation and electronics technician. So I wanted to be an aviation electronics technician. I wanted to work with airplanes, but I also wanted to work with electronics. Those mm -hmm. are my two loves. Mm -hmm. And uh, so each week I put in for that. And uh, each week we're asked, you know, where do you want to go? And each week I would say, Jacksonville, I want to be an avi aviation electronics technician. So uh, at the uh, end of boot camp, they finally said, okay, you're, <laughs> this is, these are your orders. And I was ordered, we, we had my orders, I had my orders to uh, Jacksonville, Florida. Mm -hmm. So we went through, and I say we, because my high school buddy, Dick Beachy, mm -hmm. went with me. Yeah. He, he went there also. He did. And uh, we got to uh, Jacksonville, spent eight weeks there going through training. Now what they do there is uh, they set you up in, for training for each of the different jobs available in aviation. For instance, electronics technician, there's a mechanic, aviation mechanics mate, which uh, works on engines of aircraft. Mm -hmm. There's a metal smith that works on the body of the fuselages. There's the parachute riggers. There are uh, different sorts of uh, air control. There are different, uh, uh, different schools that you can go to once you graduate from aviation school in Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. So every week I kept dutifully putting in mind to, to be uh, electronics. <coughs> Excuse me. And then <coughs> at the uh, end of the eight weeks there, then I got my orders to uh, go to uh, Memphis, Tennessee. So I, and this again that's still, where, this that's where the aviation electronics school electronics. was. So I did finally get my uh, choice. What about your buddy? He got the metalsmith, but that he was uh, he was not so sure what he wanted mm -hmm. in aviation, so I think he accepted that pretty well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think he wanted electronics. I don't recall if he wanted electronics. But to graduate, we had to uh, we had to uh, uh, start the engine of an airplane, which is what what's it really I, I, I really like. Mm -hmm. And I got to start the engine of an F four U Corsair, which was uh, one of, when I was during the war in World War II was my favorite Navy airplane. It was a gull wing, and it, uh, it was a fighter. In fact, it was made famous on uh, you know uh, on TV shows mm -hmm. quite a bit. Uh, the uh, but uh, it, it, starting that was really a pleasure. Mm -hmm. It's the only time I ever got to start an airplane, a yeah. military airplane, yeah. anyhow. Uh -huh. And I, I really enjoyed that. So then we uh, 
we left uh, Jacksonville, and uh, this by this by this time it was like December of 1951, mm -hmm. and then uh, took a train to Memphis, Tennessee, and we started seven months. I started seven months of uh, aviation electronic technician training, and they. Uh, that was uh, quite comprehensive. We took uh, theory of electronics, vacuum tube theory. Uh, of course, that, we didn't have transistors in those days. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had to uh, take uh, uh, Morse code, telegraph, to be able to do Morse code at so many words a minute. Mm -hmm. I think I got up to about eight or nine words a minute on Morse code. And learn about the different types of uh, receivers and radars that the Navy had. And uh, so that during that whole 28 weeks was a very comprehensive electronic course. And, uh, and I believe, and I, to this day I, I still believe, I think the Navy had the best technical courses of all the military services. I may be, uh, you know, prejudiced in that manner, but uh, I, I, we used to always think that. <laughs> yeah. What I'm was, sure the Air Force was, had different ideas. Yeah. What was life like other than the classes? I mean, did you have any freedom to leave the base? Yes, uh, we did. As a matter of fact, uh, <laughs> my buddy and I, uh, every weekend, when he was there for 12 weeks, and uh, and I was there for 28 weeks, and uh, we, we used to spend weekends uh, hitchhiking someplace. One time we hitchhiked to Little Rock, mm -hmm. uh, Arkansas. We met a couple of girls there, and uh, you know we uh, used to stay at a hotel, Dick and I, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for like five bucks a night. <laughs> in those days, yeah. it was a Grady Hatton Hotel, I'll never forget. And then uh, and it you was know, pretty safe to hitchhike yeah, in the, those days. I oh, guess. sure. Yeah. And then he'd pick us up, and then we go, you know, around and. Uh, yeah. And it was no, it's nothing like today. I mean, everything was really innocent, yeah. believe me, in those days. Yeah. And then uh, we, 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 we came back, I think, uh, six or eight weekends mm -hmm. when we had the, uh, when we didn't have duty. You know, you have duty uh, every, you know, one, one weekend a month, so. What would duty consist of? Um, uh, watches, standing watch, mm -hmm. and, uh, which is not very much fun. It's, it's been four hours, you know, standing watch over something that doesn't happen, you know, mm -hmm. so it got very boring. And one, one or two weekends, uh, we uh, would hitchhike uh, just to go someplace. Uh, you know, like we start on one side of the highway and nobody comes, so we walk across the highway and go the other, go the other direction. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, then a car would come pick us up. Yeah. So, I mean, particularly, uh, you had, had a pretty good degree of freedom, you mm -hmm. know, and then obviously being on your own and independent, you yeah. uh, but it as was long nice as, being able to exercise yeah. some of that freedom. But as long as you met your obligations, you showed up for class. And, oh, sure, yeah. You know, it, so these these had, are weekends. You had no classes yeah, on weekends. On weekends. So, so weekends if you didn't have the duty, you were, you were free. free. You know, you had free to travel, free to go yeah. wherever you wanted to go. Okay. So, okay. and it was a lot of fun. We had a, a good time. So what happened after this is 28 weeks well, now? Well, 28 weeks, and then... You, uh, based on your examinations and tests that you take, they give you a list of billets or uh, duty stations to go to. There were very few East Coast squadrons or East Coast, by now I was aviation electronics technician, even though I was a uh, three-striker uh, uh, airman, uh, which is uh, non-rated, non you know, what the Navy calls non-rated. So we had a choice of duty stations and ships and I was looking at the list and there's only there's only a handful of uh, East Coast squadrons and a lot of guys you know grab those immediately because they generally come from the East Coast mm -hmm. and this means they can go home on weekends mm -hmm. well I thought that was all well and good but uh, I thought you know you're only in the Navy you know I was already in almost a year or a little over a year by then and I thought my god if I don't uh, if I don't get a ship, I may never even see one. Mm -hmm. I mean, why, why go to a squadron? Some people go like at NES Glenview, Illinois, which is in the middle of the country, you know, mm -hmm. and it's far away from water, uh, unless you count Lake Michigan. Which is you, you can get. want to get on a ship. I, don't, I, I wanted to go. Yeah. I wanted to Aircraft get. carrier type? Is that what well, that's my pre preference, preference since I was uh, aviation. Right. They call us the Airedales. So mm -hmm. since I was an Airedale, that's where I wanted to go. So uh, I look at the list of ships, 
and uh, our squadrons on the west coast. A lot of our squadrons on the west coast. I, mean, I could have gone to Oakland, I could have gone to San Francisco, and, uh, but I, I, I thought, if I'm going to go that far, I'm going to go all the way. So I, I looked at the list of ships, and uh, the one thing that stuck out like a sore thumb was the USS Sisley. I thought, gee, they might have good pizza on board. <laughs> so, and really, that thought went through my mind, you know. It turned out uh, not to be true. As, in fact, it was rather lousy, you know, when they did have it. Yeah, yeah. The, the seaplane tender was on later on had better pizza. But, uh, so I, I decided to go for the uh, Sisley and uh, put in for that. And then after a uh, 30-day leave back in Elmira, then uh, we had to take the train out to the West Coast. Mm -hmm. I did. And uh, those days, it was a long, grueling trip, believe right. me. You didn't fly. In those days, you had to take a train. Now, did you have any and concerns about actually going into the Korean War? Was that no, a not, given? Not or a, not in a ship. Not, not in a ship, ship no, okay. because there was no, uh, there was no, uh, no up till then, there was no engagement uh, uh, by uh, MiGs or by the Korean, North Koreans uh, on, on ships. Okay. Uh, but uh, that comes later. Uh, I got to San Francisco, and then it turns out that the uh, I had to go to uh, Treasure Island, where I was assigned there for a week or two. Well, I had to wait for a ship to take me out to uh, where the USS Sisley was. Mm -hmm. The Sisley was already off Korea. This is at Treasure Island. Well, so I was in World Treasure Island, in San, yeah, no, in San Francisco, <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> which is closed now, incidentally. Is it? So, yeah, yeah, unfortunately. Uh, so I, I got to uh, I got to Treasure Island and finally put on a troop ship, and then the troop ship we uh, took off for Okinawa. And when I got to Okinawa, that was my first taste of foreign duty. But even mm -hmm. though it was uh, you know just for a couple of days, mm -hmm. and then uh, then we. We lifted anchor and went up to Yokosuka, Japan, which is a big Navy base. And uh, unfortunately, the uh, Sisley, I thought the Sisley would be there, but it wasn't. It was uh, on the other side of Japan in a, in a seaport called Sasebo. Mm -hmm. So they put us on a train, and we had to go across country. It was a one and a half, two day trip, as I recall. Mm -hmm. But it took us right through uh, Hiroshima. Mm -hmm. which uh, I, I thought was kind of, you know, interesting to see, although it, from the train station, we didn't get out uh, the train, but from the train we could see the, you couldn't see the damage, I think it was quite a bit built up by then, mm -hmm. even though this was only uh, six, seven, mm -hmm. six years, seven years after the, you know, after the war. And this train trip, did you have any interaction with Japanese people, or is there any? Very little. Very little. Yeah, okay. this was more of a troop train. Okay. The only thing is, is that the smoke and the uh, the ash, uh, you know, the uh, it, it was very gritty. You know, mm -hmm. we almost had, had to take our jumpers off and get down to the t-shirt, and then that got gritty and dirty after a while. Wow, this is not a clean train. Right. Yeah. And then uh, we ended up in Sasebo, and uh, the ship was in port, so I, I reported aboard, and. Uh, Kind of looking forward to our first, uh, you know, deployment. My first deployment, uh, mm -hmm. you know, at sea. And, uh, it, I was assigned to a V4 division, which was the avionics division. And there was an avionics shop on the hangar deck aft of the, you know, of, of the ship. And the avionics shop, it turns out that we uh, actually lived in there because we had uh, there's three or four guys uh, were living there, and there was an empty bunk for me. So. Even though I had a, a, an assigned bunk in the compartment down below, mm -hmm. I was able to uh, spend most of my time, you know, uh, most of my nights in the avionics shop sleeping. Was that? Uh, Which is nice. Nice. Less, yeah. less people cr less crammed people, in. Less people. You're not crammed. You know, yeah. uh, I had my bunk right up <laughs> yeah. near the uh, overhead and uh, right near a uh, pipe that came down for air. The only oh. trouble was when the when the ship was blowing its stacks, you know, which it does every so often, it uh, blows the smoke out of the stacks. Well, it sucks it in and brings it in. And I usually end up with a black t-shirt, you know, oh, which geez. started out to be white the night before. <laughs> <you know? laughs> but that was only occasionally, so yeah. uh, that was well worth the, uh, the problem. Yeah. And so uh, it, then uh, uh, part of my duties, uh, we had a, uh, 
We had a radar uh, in the shop and then uh, the radios, the uh, VHF radios that were into mm -hmm. the airplane. So every time we had to pull a, a bad radio out, we had to fix it in the shop. Mm -hmm. So I started getting a lot of uh, technician experience and, uh, you know, communication systems. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we also had a large radar that we, wasn't used on that job because we were, we were operating at the time with, uh, with Corsairs. Uh, Marine Corsairs. It was a, it was a very uh, famous uh, squadron called the Checkerboard Squadron. VMF 312 was the name of the squadron. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the pilots on the cruise before had actually shot down a MiG with a propeller aircraft, and he became the first, the first uh, uh, American pilot. There was another. There was a British pilot that shot down the MiG. Became the first Allied pilot to shoot down the MiG with a prop plane. Wow. But uh, he shot one down, uh, he was the first American pilot, Jesse Fulmer was his name. Mm -hmm. And he did that off the deck of the USS Sicily. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you'll find that, uh, that the USS Bataan, which is a light carrier, would claim that, but uh, mm -hmm. it's not true. Mm -hmm. He actually flew off the deck of the USS Sicily. Because when we returned from that cruise, uh, on the bridge, we painted uh, all kinds of buildings and things that the aircraft had destroyed. You know, mm -hmm. like the, he would uh, have buildings and tower, TV tower, I mean, uh, radar towers uh, painted up there. And right mm -hmm. in the middle of all this was one MiG. I wish I'd taken a picture of that. that yeah. uh, you know, dumb things you don't do. <laughs> I mean, smart things you don't <clears throat> do. Kind of like the guy in the Western yeah. putting notches on his gun. Right. Paint, yeah. But we had, uh, while we were there, uh, since we had experience, see, when we were when I was at uh, Memphis, we, we were doing a lot of radar flying uh, the last two weeks. We've flown in uh, DC-3s using one type of radar, and then we've flown in twin, twin Beechcraft flying to find another type of radar. Mm -hmm. And we were doing uh, simulated bombing runs up, up and down the Mississippi River, north of Memphis and south of it. And so <coughs> during all that time, you get used to radio talk. You know, uh, you get used to the lingo mm -hmm. because uh, you're 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 using it. You're trained to use it. So when I was on the Sicily, they asked me if I would be interested in working in air control. And air control uh, is where you're you're working in the bridge during flight operations, and they they uh, you're, you're you're handling what they call the land launch frequency. While they're on the deck, and shortly after they get airborne, they're under your control. But once they get airborne, then they switch over to combat intelligence, mm -hmm. or CIC, Combat Intelligence Center. And then CIC will then guide them out to the target area, and then they do all of the discussion. And then uh, when the mission's over and they're en route back to the carrier, they'll turn, turn them back over to me or to an uh, air control guy. <laughs> and usually they're in a formation of three or four, usually four, and uh, they would come back towards the ship, and then I'd pick them up, and then they'd say goose. But we were, code word was goosebump mm -hmm. for the Sisley. Mm -hmm. And uh, so each of the aircraft were known, was known as goosebump aircraft. Goosebump 14, goosebump 13, you know, whatever their side number mm -hmm. was. So they were, one guy, the leader would report in this goosebump, uh, you know, for a landing. Mm -hmm. And then the air officer would be the guy to tell me when I can, you know, land them or not land them. And if, uh, if our deck, remember we had a straight deck in those days, we didn't have an angled deck. Okay. So if the aircraft were aft, then they had to move them forward so that they could trap the aircraft. And so sometimes uh, they would, there would be a little delay. So you give them the uh, signal to uh, dog at Angels 1.5, which means basically, you know, just circle the ship at 1,500 feet. Okay. And then until I tell you, you know, prep Charlie, which means prepare to land and then Charlie means land. So uh, basically they would do that. Now if they came back from a bombing uh, rocket run, sometimes they'll have what they call a hung ordinance. And a guy will have a hung bomb or a hung rocket, which means he fired it but it didn't leave the airplane. Mm. So they don't know if that thing is, you know, they don't know the situation on the, on the wing, whether whether it's just dangling there, and as soon as you touch down, it's so going to fall. So somebody on the deck has got to visualize that? Well, oh. you, 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 there's not much <laughs> visualizing. I mean, you'll see it, but you don't know if it's held on tightly or not. 
And one case, we had a rocket, uh, the Zuni rocket, that the uh, that the guy reported. I have a one hung Zuni rocket. So I had a grease pencil, and I would write all this down on the uh, plexiglass uh, mm -hmm. uh, window. And um, more often than not, the or ordinance usually holds. But there's been tragedies. Uh, other carriers, uh, mm -hmm. I think the Bennington was one. Uh, there was. Uh, the Hancock was another one, the USS Hancock, uh, where a, a, a bomb actually left and blew up. And I recall the story because the photographer took a picture, actually had taken the, the picture that uh, they, they developed, showed a piece of shrapnel coming right at him, which turned out to be the piece that killed him. But he had a picture taken of that piece of shrapnel, I'll never forget that. So this is but a plane we, coming in that has an ordinance that right. and didn't, when they crashed, was fired but didn't leave the plane. It and, didn't leave the plane. And it exploded when it landed. It, it, it fell off and, and exploded. Okay. Uh, <laughs> now and then you, you, those situations occurred. It didn't happen with us, fortunately. But a, a, a Zuni rocket did leave the airplane, but it was, it, did, it was not fired. It just literally came loose and then bounced up the deck. <laughs> and then this guy in his white suit who, uh, you know, they couldn't pay me that kind of money, <laughs> you know, uh, to go out, picked it up and threw it over the side. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it slammed up against the gun tub and I thought, gee, oh my that, God. but uh, he still went and over, so picked some it guy up had and threw it over. Just pick Somebody it had to do it, yeah. Ooh. And he gets paid the same as I do. Wow. Know, being up there in relative safety. But wow. that only happened once. Mm -hmm. And uh, accidents, uh, you see, Occasionally, where they miss the wire, they miss the tail hook, misses the wire, yeah. and on the straight deck, they have these uh, barriers put up. You know, two cables stretched across, and I have maybe four sets of those. Yeah. So they always have those up, and uh, and occasionally a guy will go into that and uh, prop will snag, you know, snag the cable, and it'll cause it to stop, and it may tip over a little bit. Yeah. I never had a. We had only one fire, and that was on an aircraft that the engine came loose <laughs> and uh, there was a Grumman uh, Guardian, AF-2S, and uh, he landed. It's kind of a bulky airplane. It's one of the, I was with Grumman for a number of years and they're known as the Iron Works and I don't know how this airplane ever got out of it because it, it wasn't built that sturdy. And uh, when he when he hit, he hit on the left gear and then snapped on the right gear and that whole engine just dropped down to the deck. You could see the, I, 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 I look, it was almost funny. The pilot just <laughs> was sitting there and he, he quickly unstrapped himself and just hopped down, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the engine w and from the instrument panel forward was was down. down? Yeah. And then uh, that started on fire, but they quickly got that off. Oh, good. But uh, okay. that, was the only, uh, that was the only real serious one that mm -hmm. we've had. We've had a couple close where they went off the deck, but not quite. Not quite. No, they, uh, they, were, they were still engaged with a tail hook, but uh, they, mm -hmm. they kind of slithered off the side. Now they were capable for to repair most of these planes right on the ship. Yes. Well, most. Yes. Uh, I mean, I imagine there might be some things that could. Yes, but there was one plane. Most things uh, could be repaired. There was one plane uh, that. Uh, this is funny because it was a TB a TBF a Grumman TBF Avenger, that was a radar plane. It was work. Uh, we were working ASW, which is any submarine warfare. And it was number thirteen, and. Uh, I, they had to change the engine on the hangar deck. I, I used to remember walking by and see all these parts, you know, mm -hmm. uh, laying around, thinking, "Boy, I hate to be the poor sucker has to fly that thing when it's done." Well, I kept bugging the squadron, "Let me fly, you know. Let me have a flight, you know. I, I wanted to uh, work the radar because I was uh, I was also the expert on that particular radar, EPS 20 radar." And so he let me, and it uh, turned out that it was number 13, <laughs> the one that I saw being dismantled. Oh, you said you had to fly Yeah, it. so they, uh, uh, they they let me fly in, in it, uh, you know, uh, because it was a test top, you had to go test the engine. And so it was the first time I ever catapulted off a carrier. And, uh, and we got airborne, and boy, I was in my glory because the radar was working great. I could, you know, mm -hmm. I could see, I could even pick up the coast of Japan. We were off Japan at the mm -hmm. time, and uh, it's one of the few opportunities I ever had to see that air, that radar, you know, mm -hmm. actually work yeah. in, a, in, in, a, in, the, in an aircraft in the environment. So I was loving it. Yeah. And it was a, supposed to be a three and a half hour hop, and after about two and a half hours, 
the pilot reported uh, 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 the fuel pump. No, no, it was a, there was another problem. Uh, oil leak because it was hitting the windshield. Mm -hmm. And he had an oil leak, so he, he declared what he called a preferred emergency, which means I want to come in, but don't, don't, uh, don't. It's not that serious of an, of mm -hmm. a, an emergency. So they cleared the deck, and uh, we came in. And uh, when we landed, and they, again, this is my first carrier landing. Uh, when we landed, uh, I felt one heck of a jolt. You know, uh, the your uh, straps here did pushing right in, and. Uh, I thought it was normal. As many landings I've seen, you know, from from the mm -hmm. bridge, you know, hundreds of landings. You always visualize what it's going to be like until you actually do it. And it looked to me as rough as I ever imagined it to be. But the pilot got out, and the first thing he did was apologize. Oh, okay. And and I said, I said, well, I thought it was all right. And he said, no. He said, you just normally should feel a slight uh, indentation, you know, oh, pressure yeah. on your shoulder. Yeah. But he says, I think I, I think I really damaged the aircraft. And uh, we looked at the uh, the top of the tail of the fuselage, where the fuselage and the tail come together. It's called yeah. the empennage. It was actually crinkled and buckled. Wow. And that was serious. Uh, as a matter of fact, that was the last flight of that aircraft. It's a good that thing. was beyond repair. And he didn't know that was in the in the back. I mean, what he saw no, was he, oil he, on the front. Right. That, no, that was the first problem. But <coughs> so this, after landing, after landing, that it created the other problem right. because of the hard landing, oh, that okay. it actually buckled the tail. Oh, okay. And see, that's a major, major uh, problem. You right. you need to go to an over overhaul and repair facility for right. something that serious. I don't think they had to. It was beyond a capability repair. So of the they scrapped the number carrier. thirteen then. So what they did is they 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 took out all the equipment, and the next day they shoved it over the side. Oh really? So, yeah, so I got I got to ride the last flight of number thirteen. <laughs> so, you didn't even know enough to be afraid on the landing, did you? Uh, no. I mean, so, <laughs> just sort of. No, I've I've uh, landed on carriers and took off from carriers, but that was later in my career as yeah. a civilian. But yeah. uh, when I was with uh, Litton and Grumman, yeah. but uh, this this one was my first, and uh, because of it, I was able to join a tail hook uh, uh, tail hook thing. Uh, I was a member of the tail hook, Navy tail hook. Uh -huh. yeah. The one that came under so much fire. I was going to say, the only thing I know yeah. about a tail hook is not good. But no, that was a Las Vegas thing. <laughs> That's right. Uh, they're now in Reno. They still, they still, they still meet. Yeah. But this year I think it's good. Yeah. Last year I was in Reno, this year. Yeah. Uh, I'm no longer a member. I was a member for a few years, but mm -hmm. uh, I let it lapse. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't make it out there half the time. Well, was, uh, what was the criteria for being a member? Just that you we had got to one one carrier one. trap. You had, a, okay. you had to at least uh, land on a carrier once. Once, okay. So okay. and I qualified. Oh, okay. I qualified later, but uh, yeah. I mean, that was the one that yeah that qualified. I hang my hand on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, uh, it was a lot of fun, and then uh, the uh, one embarrassing experience I had. We had a helicopter that uh, had to deliver guard mail to to the other ships in our task force because mm -hmm. usually we'd have two or three uh, we'd have two or three of the uh, uh, carry uh, destroyers mm -hmm. usually running plane guard mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, for us and what would happen is that the after after the we launch aircraft then the guy would take the guard mail and other mail mm -hmm. and deliver it to the other to the other uh, ships and uh, my first uh, within my first month of uh, and of being in the bridge and talking, uh, the, the chopper pilot called in and said, uh, "I'm through. What's what? What? I, I'm a, I finished. I finished delivery of mail. What should I do?" Well, I didn't hear him. I didn't know what the heck he was saying. Mm -hmm. And so, I'd say, uh, you know, goosebump angel, which we call the helicopter. Uh, say again, you know, mm -hmm. and then. Then he'd, I, and I'd try and be very careful to get it this time, and I still couldn't get it. Mm -hmm. So I'd say, uh, Angel, uh, please repeat all after, you know. And then he, he was yelling by this time, I'm through, you know. And, and, and of course, I was starting to get nervous as, he, as hell. And, and uh, here, I, you know, like I'm really blowing it. Right. And, uh, and, and now you're, you're trying so hard, there's no way you're going to hear it. <laughs> So, and I'm down like this, and you know, and I'm not even looking. Yeah. 
And then the next thing I, I look, I look up, and there he is right alongside the bridge, and he opened the door, and he was yelling. <laughs> well, I tell you, I felt like uh, I felt like I was three inches tall. You know? I mean, I didn't know what he said, but I know what he says. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm through. It went like this. You know, yeah. I'm done. You know, what do I do? Yeah. <laughs> it, but uh, it, Ensign Williford, I'll never forget that son of a gun. I'll never forget his name. Yeah. Williford. He, in fact, I saw him ten years later at, uh, when I was uh, feeling near Tuxent River. Yeah, I saw him on the bus, and uh, yeah. before I realized who he was, he got up and left. And do you keep track, or have you any of your buddies? Or yes, you uh, as a matter of fact, I'm glad track. you mentioned that. Two buddies that I served on the ship yeah. within the past year have contacted me. Oh, good. And one I was like 50 years old. I mean, 50 years ago. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. This, this happened all 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way they got a hold of me was that uh, the USS Sisley has an association, and I signed in once a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And you know, you sign in, you put your name and your email address, and then uh, every so often I get an email from somebody like that. Mm -hmm. Is this the uh, Bob Sardle from Elmar, New York? You know? Oh, nice! And, that's, and you know, and I can return them, then we start a flurry of yeah. You know, even swapping pictures. Uh, oh, I mean, I, I, I got pictures that uh, I don't remember seeing uh, since then, that they had of me, you know. Right, right. And I may have some of them. Yeah, yeah. I had some of them. That, so uh, you they didn't share see. that back and forth. Yeah. So oh, that's uh, nice. That's really one of the neatest things, you know, particularly about the Internet. You know? Yeah. Because you can chase all that down. Yeah. So yeah. anyhow, we, uh, we, we were in, uh, you know, our wartime experience. Uh, the aircraft that we had, the first cruise, and this was in 1952, uh, to, uh, 1952 from July to uh, November, December, we were in the thick of the uh, Korean War. Mm -hmm. There was a uh, mock invasion scheduled for Wonsan, which is up in northern Korea, and uh, that mock invasion was supposed to, well, we thought it was a real invasion. Because we were getting prepared for a real invasion of Wonsan, but it turned out to be a mock invasion, mm -hmm. and that really disappointed us. But uh, we went up to, you know, just prior to that date uh, that we had it was, I think, August uh, of uh, 52, mm -hmm. September. We went up to northern Japan to pick up some ammo. We had two days of loading ammo. And then, then uh, we set sail for South Korea, and uh, where we we're going to do some exercises with the Marines as a training squad, but that was kind of a ploy. It was to show the North Koreans that we were up to something, that we were going oh. to do something. <clears throat> okay. And, uh, and it was the first time I'd ever seen a smoke screen. You know, you see it in the movies, but I never yeah. saw one before. Yeah. We had the stories with us, and uh, as we were going fairly close to uh, North Korean coast, on the way back down towards South Korea, they actually uh, they actually uh, sent out the uh, you know thick billowy clouds of smoke, and oh. I never could understand anyhow because you know usually your radars will penetrate that. You know. yeah. The but, North uh, Koreans were doing that. I'm sure they were. Yeah. That was an old World War II thing. Mm -hmm. But it was nice seeing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we went to South Korea off uh, Busan, I believe, and that's on the west side. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we we uh, had the Marines like they were practicing invading. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we, we uh, hauled in all, not we, but the troop ships, hauled in all of the landing craft. Mm -hmm. And then we set sail for north. We went out and then back in towards Wonsan. And then uh, that day we were very heavily involved with uh, land, you know, landing the aircraft and loading them and launching them. Mm -hmm. We were doing a lot of uh, softening up on the beach, and it looked like in preparation for an invasion. Mm -hmm. our, our, we got within 10 miles of the uh, of the coast, and with mm -hmm. the binoculars, I was in the bridge. You could see puffs of smoke. That's about the closest I got to combat. Yeah. And uh, can I ask you, what was the softening up entail? Uh, bombarding. bombarding. Uh, the bombarding. naval ships were bombarding, and <laughs> our aircraft were mm -hmm. uh, doing doing. Uh, bombing also, right. uh, selected targets. Right. And I saw one, you know, against the hill, you know, did the uh, dive bomb and tossed one in. So then we were kind of waiting for this war to, 
you know, hopefully that, uh, you know, something would happen that we could be mm -hmm. part of, you know, like, son, I was in a, the invasion of Bon San, but uh, yeah. you know, nobody have, uh, would have ever heard of it yeah. except us, because yeah. it never occurred. <laughs> And, uh, it, it, it was certainly nothing like D-Day, you know. Right, right. But, uh, we, we did, we did have, a, a, it was pretty, pretty interesting because it, the landing craft were dropped and then had, headed to, uh, headed to the beach, except they were empty. And really? they got within a thousand yards of the beach and they all turned around. And this is what the government said. We only did that to show them that we still had the capability to invade them. You know, okay. <laughs> I don't know what. Um, you know, uh, it, to me that was kind of a dumb thing. You know, yeah. but what do I know? Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, uh, that, but for those those two weeks that we were involved in this whole operation, we we got a battle star, okay. and we got the right free on all of our mail. So because we were in a combat zone, oh. even though no combat occurred. So, okay. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, that was uh, that was kind of disappointing. Yeah. Uh, October fifteenth, come to think of maybe that's what it was. Yeah. October fifteenth. Yeah. That name, uh, that date sticks in my craw. Mm -hmm. That uh, that was the uh, planned mock invasion of Wonsan. Mm -hmm. So hopefully uh, other people may have been involved also and remember that. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, it was it was disappointing to say the least. Yeah. So then now uh, we we came back to the mm -hmm. states. That was our. That was the Sicily's third tour of duty mm -hmm. in Korea, mm -hmm. and my first uh, on its third tour. Uh, the ship was known as the Galloping Ghost of the Korean Coast. That uh, I never forget that uh, because it, from 1950 on, I mean, it, it like I said, it was three cruises in a period of a year and a half, mm -hmm. and uh, it year and a half, two years. So they uh, they were it, it was a uh, it was a well-known ship, uh, you know, among the people out there. One of the commanding officers, when it got that reputation, was uh, uh, Captain uh, Jimmy Thatch. And Jimmy Thatch was famous for a World War II maneuver that he, that he invented called a Thatch Weave. Any fighter pilot, particularly in the Navy, uh, you know, would, would probably be familiar with it. Mm -hmm. But he was the commanding officer of the uh, ship. Uh, before I got on, I, 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 he wasn't on when I was on, mm -hmm. but uh, he was on before that. And he was a very, very well-known uh, World War II hero, mm -hmm. uh, in my mind. And I, I'm pretty sure history will bear me out on that. Mm -hmm. Particularly, in fact, I think I see I saw it on Wings once. Uh, it may have been on, uh, you know, the story of the thatch weave mm -hmm. and how he was able to do a maneuver that. Uh, it kind of sucked into the enemy aircraft behind you, you know, mm -hmm. you kind of weave out and you come back in again and then he goes right by you and right you're, you're on his tail. Oh, okay. So it's just quite a, quite a, quite a nice maneuver. Yeah. Very effective. Yeah. Do you often watch some of the um, Hollywood productions of the various Not wars Hollywood, I or prefer history. <laughs> the history, like the History Channel? Yeah. The I, documentary? I, like the, the Pearl Harbor movie I didn't care for because yeah. uh, the same people involved with the with the Pearl Harbor mm -hmm. were not the ones that were on the B-25 raid over Tokyo. I mean, this is mm -hmm. all Hollywood stuff. Yeah. And uh, when I when I saw that, I just lost interest in mm -hmm. the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd rather see documentaries, you know, right. that you can get in the Best Buy of World War II. Yeah. But, so the ship returned to the U.S., to San Diego, in uh, early uh, December of 52. And then uh, we went back out again in July of 53. Uh, in the meantime, we were doing exercises off the coast. Mm -hmm. And on the way uh, back, the Korean War ended. July of 53, I think they signed the peace treaty. Mm -hmm. So we were relegated, you might say, to uh, anti-submarine warfare. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, ASW aircraft. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the airplanes were flown were the A, what they call the AF-2S and 2W, which is built by Grumman. One had a large radar on that I would I had gone through eight weeks uh, while we were back in the U.S. I went through eight weeks of uh, training in San Diego on that radar. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other one was what they called a killer, would have uh, carry Sonoboys on board, and the Sonoboys were tubular in shape uh, when you drop them. 
uh, when they hit the water, they would break into three sections. Uh, the bottom section would be a sonar transmitter, and it would go down and tethered to a to a wire. Mm -hmm. And then the top section would float, and it had a little transmitter on. It would transmit the receiver signal uh, mm -hmm. back to the aircraft. So this is how you so monitored yeah. any of the submarines. Well, yeah, you dropped a pattern like maybe five five different sound boys, they say different because each one, each receiver would be a different frequency. Mm -hmm. And then as a submarine would say between two and three, that signal would be strong. So the operator knew where that submarine was. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the, uh, the other aircraft would come in with uh, depth charges and drop the depth it's charges. Really so that's how they would do that. Mm -hmm. So basically we spent seven months doing ASW training. Uh, one, t one time uh, I was up on the bridge, we had an exercise where a submarine, we, we worked with submarines, American submarines, fortunately. <laughs> uh, this, one, uh, this one got close to us. They're not supposed to get close to you. Between the ship's ray of sonar and the sonoboids. And also we had helicopters we were operating with that had sonoboy balls. And a chopper would come in and then drop this into the water. Mm -hmm. And, and and it would uh, you know it would uh, uh, tend to you know search for uh, uh, signals where it would bounce off and let mm -hmm. the uh, chopper pilot know what was down there. Mm -hmm. And usually you use two choppers. They come in like this. They drop drop the thing, and then if they don't get anything, they pick it up and rotate, and then drop it again. Oh, they could pick it up. Yeah. No, no, oh. Yeah. The the line. The, yeah. the sonar bar. The sonar. The, the sound boy. Or the sonar itself. The transmitter is in a round ball. Okay. It's on the end of a cable. So they would drop that and then pick it up. And uh, we had the uh, we had the uh, uh, submarine come in pretty close to us, and the got past the helicopters because they were still out farther. And then the ship sonar uh, missed it. And uh, you know, and I, right off our port quarter on the left side of the ship, facing aft, uh, there was th three green flares that came up out of the water. And uh, that signified that the destroy that the submarine had fired three torpedoes at us. Mm -hmm. They okay. got close enough. So he to got us. I mean right. basically he got us. Right. So the captain was mad and he opened it. I remember <laughs> He uh, opened the radio and said, Sonar, Captain. He, yes, sir. He said, how come you didn't catch that sub off the water? We thought it was a school of shrimp. And he said, well, it's the first time I ever saw shrimps, you know, fire three uh, green flares. <laughs> <laughs> Forget that. Uh, those guys really took a hit that yeah, time. Yeah. But uh, that, that was the whole game. Uh, yeah. Basically, you're, you're, you know, Russian submarines uh, were very active in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that was active were... Uh, mm -hmm. Chinese communist fishing boats, okay. and I used to yeah. love those because they, uh, you see a fishing boat out there and they got about 15 different types of antennas coming out of it, yeah. you know, and you wonder what kind yeah. of fish they're going after, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But they're, I think I remember stories they, oh, about, they, they, yeah, you know, well, they used and, to and follow the us. They always followed us, and, yeah. and what they're trying <laughs> to do is pick up frequencies, mm -hmm. you know, for jamming later on, and uh, they're mm -hmm. picking up uh, conversations, they're, they're picking up anything they can. Right. Tactics. Uh, so, in a, they're just far enough back we can't do anything. Yeah. And some of uh, the uh, anti-submarine warfare aircraft, the ones that had the depth charges, also had a searchlight, a very powerful searchlight on the wing. Mm -hmm. And uh, these guys were powerless. They couldn't do anything because uh, it was international waters. So the only thing they thought they could do is uh, fly over them at nighttime and then turn a searchlight on and oh. hopefully keep them awake, keep them from sleep. But yeah. that was about yeah. the worst that they could do to them. Yeah. And they, that what they would do, you know, just just for yeah. having fun. But that was about yeah. it. Yeah. You couldn't do anything else. But uh, those yeah. Chinese communist fishing boats were really a laugh. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you wonder how much fishing they really did. You know, what the kind of fishing they were doing was uh, right. I think electronic. Right. So that uh, that. Pretty much, uh, we were visiting a lot of ports uh, out there. We went to Guam two mm -hmm. or three times, uh -huh. and, uh, which is kind of a desolate place. Mm -hmm. And uh, went to uh, Hong Kong once. Yeah. Great, great place. Great, great Liberty Town. Yeah. And uh, Kobe, Japan, uh, was a nice, nice out of the way. You know, it's not a 
wasn't a Navy town, you know, you go into mm -hmm. a Navy town and uh, it seems right. like the U.S. Navy just stamps <laughs> their presence there, you know, mm -hmm. it's just, it was nice going to a town and not see yeah. 10,000 other sailors, you know. Right. In, so. in that particular situation, was there any, any ability to interact with the, the local people or? Quite a bit, uh, particularly mm -hmm. the women. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, no, it, it never had any problems. Uh, of course, Good. this was several years later. Sure. Uh, we we got through the second cruise, my second cruise on the uh, on the carrier. By by now it was early fifty uh, three, mm -hmm. and uh, no fifty four. We got back from the uh, cruise in, in nineteen fifty four. And uh, the ship was pulled into Hunters Point, San Francisco. And I got off, I got reassigned. And I got reassigned to a uh, uh, seaplane tender called mm -hmm. the, uh, the uh, USS Salisbury Sound. Mm -hmm. And the seaplane tender, what it does is it takes care of seaplanes, uh, the maintenance for seaplanes. Mm -hmm. And I say this was in 50, uh, 54, yeah. I got. Uh, I left the Sicily and had to go up to Vallejo, uh, Mare Island, uh, Upper Northern California. And uh, as soon as I reported aboard the seaplane tender and reported in the avionics shop, they said, "Don't unpack your sea bag. We're sending it down to San Diego again to go to school." Mm -hmm. So it was another eight-week course on the radar for uh, the seaplane, which is a P5M uh, twin-engine seaplane. Mm -hmm. And it was a very large radar, uh, very similar to the radar that I, you know, had uh, gone to school on for the, you know, uh, on the ASW aircraft, you know, the uh, search radar. Right. So I spent eight weeks down there, and then when I got out of school, the ship had already headed for the uh, Far East on a cruise, but I was in San Diego. Mm -hmm. So I got to, uh, they sent me up to Travis to uh, get an airplane to fly out there. To the ship? To the ship. And uh, and in those days, you didn't go, you know, like one hop. <laughs> You're there. Mm -hmm. you, uh, we went, for, uh, after two or three days of waiting, I finally got onto an airplane. We went to uh, Hickam Field in Hawaii. And I was there two or three days waiting for another airplane to take me further. <laughs> I see. And uh, to Guam, actually. And uh, and we stopped at Kwasalein Island uh, for refueling. And then on to uh, uh, Guam. And then I was there a couple of three days, and uh, we uh, then got another airplane to Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. And the Philippines is where I was supposed to go. Uh, and then from there to Sangley Point uh, in the Philippines, which is a seaplane base. Uh -huh. And when I got there, I said, well, where's the ship? <laughs> and nobody knew. You just flying all around. And I thought, well, I said, yeah, I thought it was supposed to be here at Sangley Point. And they said, well, no, they don't know where it is. And so here I was, I, I, I was out of clean white uh, uniform and uh, I had mm -hmm. no money because uh, I'd spent everything I had. I had like maybe five bucks. Mm -hmm. I blew that the first night in, uh, in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And then after that I was completely broke and I was on a receiving ship. It's kind of unusual ship. that they didn't know where the ship was, isn't it? Yeah, it, it was. And, mm -hmm. uh, and the receiving ship that I was on was a very hot and, you know, and I was on like the third deck down below. Uh, the receiving ship I was on was right next to a squad, uh, seaplane squadron. Well, I happened to meet a guy, uh, a sailor with, that was on the receiving ship. He just came in that was on a seaplane. He, he would belong to a squadron. And they were flying patrol uh, between Formosa, which is now Taiwan, mm -hmm. and the Chinese coast. And uh, the storm came in, so they headed for the Philippines. And uh, the uh, he got to the, they were supposed to go into a place called Boko Co, I think, uh, in the Pescadores, which is island chain between uh, between uh, Taiwan and uh, China. And it was this, this storm was a typhoon, so they had to put into the uh, Philippines. And I, I got to meet him. Uh, we headed off and and uh, went to went to uh, Chow Hall together mm -hmm. and uh, went you know spent some time and then. He told me that that squadron there, uh, you know, the next day he said, gee, if you're going to, he said, it's Salisbury Sound. He, he heard it was heading towards Hong Kong. I said, you mean it's not coming down here? And he said, no. 
But uh, he said, uh, and I said, well, I, I don't want him to go to Hong Kong without me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and, and he said, well, why don't you check with that squadron and see if they got any aircraft going up there? Because he's, he said, that's one of the squadrons that operates with a, with a uh, seaplane tender. Mm -hmm. So I ran over there to the, uh, to the duty office right after breakfast one morning. And I said, do you happen to have anything uh, going to the Salisbury Sound? He says, yeah, we got one going on at 10 o'clock this morning. You know, this is like 7.30 in the morning since we had early mm -hmm. breakfast. And I said, can I get a ride? And he said, we got orders? And I said, well, sure do, you know. And he said, well, yeah, be here at uh, 10. So I went, I went back. I didn't even see the guy to thank him, you know. Mm -hmm. I never, never saw him again. Mm -hmm. I went, packed my sea bag and uh, grabbed everything and, mm -hmm. and had to run all the way down to personnel to get my orders and then back again. Mm -hmm. And I made it uh, by 10 o'clock. And uh, by 10.30, I was on the plane, and uh, we were taxiing out on the water, and we had a jet assisted takeoff. First time I ever had that, you know, a jet bottle, yeah. which uh, wasn't very sensational, but uh, it was nice. And we, we took off and headed towards uh, Hong Kong. And see, they had to deliver the mail to the ship, which is the reason they went up there. And they had a lot of bags of mail in there. And I was mm -hmm. down in the hold. And, one of the guys came down from the flight deck and he said, he said, I see you're an aviation electronics technician. He said, do you know anything about the radar? I said, yeah, I just got out of EPS 44 school. He said, hey, why don't you come on up and I'll let you operate it. Oh, good. So I got up and I, I spent the rest of the hop operating the radar. Good. All the way into Hong Kong. Well, that was know. nice of him to. Oh, it was very nice. You yeah. Know? And, you know, up there you have coffee, you have food. Yeah. <laughs> was down there I was yeah. just all by myself. Yeah. Oh, that so, was nice. So anyhow, uh, then we got to uh, Hong Kong and landed and was your I got, ship there? Uh, yeah. Oh, oh good. yeah. I just came, I just got in, so I didn't lose yeah. a day. You know? Oh good. The only my only problem was money, you see. But they had a special payday like they usually do when they pull into a Liberty Port. Mm -hmm. And uh, but they were closed. Uh, I got onto the boat uh, with a mail, and uh, yeah, I walked aboard and see some of the guys in the shop. Said Jesus, they really didn't expect to see me for a long time, you know. Uh -huh. and, uh, and I said, hey, uh, what about pay? And he said, what? Well, Go, go check, they might give you a special pay. So I knocked mm -hmm. on the door and they, sure oh, enough, they, oh boy, I tell you, I went into yeah. town that night. And <laughs> <laughs> had a good time, huh? Oh yeah, Hong Kong is a great place. Yeah. Great place for liberty. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I took a lot of movies there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot of movies on a ship. Uh, I had a 16 millimeter camera. Mm -hmm. But it's my job on the ship, turns out, that uh, we had a radar uh, set up in the shop. And when the... Uh, Aircraft came up from the Philippines. We were in Okinawa. See, after we left Hong Kong, we went back to Okinawa in Buckner Bay. And mm -hmm. we uh, usually either anchored out or fortunately, sometimes we'd be able to get at the dock. But if we were anchored out or even at the dock, uh, the aircraft uh, would fly from the Philippines, uh, Sangley Point. They would do a reconnaissance flight along the uh, Chinese coast mm -hmm. and do a kind of a zigzag pattern and then find out what they can. In fact, they're still doing that today, <laughs> only they're using P3s. Mm -hmm. But at that time we used the P5, and this is in the 50s. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've been at this for a long, long time. Is, and is uh, they so then they would land. Part. Are they taking photos of the? Uh, not so much in the old days. They may do that now. Mm -hmm. I mean, the technology nowadays uh, with, uh, mm -hmm. with cameras, uh, aviation cameras is uh, fantastic. Yeah. But uh, in those days, uh, they were lucky just just looking at activity. The radar, the radar, the EPS-44, of course, was classified then, but they had a, a, a range of oh, about 200 miles. It was a very high uh, power in the megawatt range uh, of uh, power. And it had two, two frequencies. One, you know, one was short-term pulse search, and the other one was, uh, you know, further... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, where you could pick up pick up targets uh, up to 200 miles away, depending on your altitude. So, would you be on the planes at this time? Uh, yeah, well, the radar? no, I was I was on the <laughs> ship. Service, I was on the ship. The ship but see if they, they had a in. problem with the radar when yeah, they yeah. landed, they had to have it fixed for the return flight, okay. and that was my job. Okay. So uh, then, uh, you know, they would call okay. in, so I'd get an update. They would come in for a day or two, mm -hmm. and uh, and then take off again. And <clears throat> so what I do is get 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 a boat, a coxswain to give me get a, get get a boat for me, and then you know drive me out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I'd check it out, and if I needed anything, I'd go back to the ship. I'd take their old box, take that back to the ship and uh, to the shop, and then take my box, which is working, and then mm -hmm. replace it, and then get them up and running, and then spend the time uh, fixing theirs while uh, waiting for another airplane to mm -hmm. come. So it worked out pretty well. And uh, you know, I, I got quite familiar with uh, you know radar circuits, and, which set me up for a civilian life. Believe me. <laughs> right. Yeah. It sounds like Later you got on, excellent training and yeah. just continually. Yeah. Well, I, I uh, getting those two major radar uh, schools. Mm -hmm. Not often you do that, because when I left the, the Sicily, uh, they were supposed to have frozen my rate because. I was a, I had a special job code for that particular radar, AEW radar. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were supposed to send me to uh, either a squadron or another ship that used that rate. And they didn't. They mm -hmm. sent me to a seaplane tender mm -hmm. where you don't use that type of radar, mm -hmm. you see. Mm -hmm. <coughs> then when I got there, I, I was able to go down to, uh, to uh, San Diego and then learn another major radar. Uh, and, that was a special job code too. So I, I ended up uh, probably one of the few guys that, that went up through two schools yeah. and had uh, had both the ASW radar and an AEW radar training. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think I'm going to interrupt because I think this tape is almost done. I'll pop okay. another one in, sure, and then you can continue on. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Been that long? Yeah. Oh, no. Okay. So as I said, I uh, I was fortunate in getting I was fortunate in getting uh, uh, training in two major types of radar, sure. AEW and ASW radar, They're, yeah. which is in the megawatt range. It's a very large radar and had a lot of sweep circuits and pulse circuits. Are these both for the submarine? Um, no, no, the uh, anti-submarine warfare. Uh, okay. The uh, well, actually, reconnaissance. The the uh, first one was uh, more AEW, but was used in, in ASW work. Mm -hmm. They, uh, when I was on the carrier, that radar had the ability to uh, pick up a snorkeling submarine uh, at, at quite a quite a distance away. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, this guy could be, you know, with his periscope out of the water and not realize that he's being tracked from maybe as much as 100 miles away on, wow. on this radar. Wow. And it also had the ability to uh, data link the radar return back to the ship and effectively increase in the area of search for the ship. So if the, if the aircraft is 100 miles away, mm -hmm. which was the, roughly the range of the data link, it can see 200 miles away, then that effectively gives the ship a 300 mile range that it wouldn't have normally, you know, mm -hmm. because the air, it, it was low and uh, uh, radar is line of sight, so beyond 20, 30 miles, 40 miles, you're not going to pick up anything mm -hmm. unless you can get a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, so the ship could get this information and, and be that far right, away and could, still be tracking actually, the submarine? Or, or uh, yeah. say, enemy ships. Sure. Say, enemy ships could be uh, the other thing. But mm -hmm. during the Korean War, we didn't worry about that. In fact, uh, mm -hmm. that should back up a little. We only had one general quarters, and all the time we were, you know, I was on in Korea, uh, off Korea, that uh, that was real. We had a lot of practice, you know, general quarters, general quarters, all hands, major battle stations. Right. One time that happened where we had a what they called a we had a target uh, or enemy aircraft that was about 40 miles out and was heading our way. Mm -hmm. So they they picked it up. They called general quarters. And then it got within 20 miles. It was called a bogey. A, a bogey is, is unidentified, could be friend or foe. Mm -hmm. And then they, they call it a bandit. They, they had identified it as being an enemy. But got within 20 miles of us and then turned off. And mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, on the hangar deck just outside our avionics uh, uh, shop about five or six <laughs> napalm bombs <laughs> on, on carts. And uh, which they immediately had taken to the side and threw it overboard, oh, okay. just in case. Just I mean, case, if the, yeah. the guy decided to throw a bomb or strafe yeah. and yeah, one of those you hit. You need to have your own stuff Yeah, you don't want to be face. cooked by, uh, yeah. by your own 
you know, you're off the right. napalm. So right. we, we, we they, they uh, jettisoned it off the ship. Yeah. And then he turned away and then uh, they were secured. But that was the only time we ever had a, yeah. a ever had a, a, a closest to an enemy uh, plane, yeah. you know. Yeah. Good. But back on the uh, seaplane tender, uh, we came back in early 1955, and uh, the uh, it <coughs> the, uh, the what was interesting is that uh, having this radar background, uh, you know, we did some exercises off, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in and out of uh, Alameda. Uh, that was uh, kind of interesting, but. It was almost like it was biding my time until my enlisted enlistment ended. Mm -hmm. When we got back, my mother and father did drive up from Elmira to meet the ship in Alameda mm -hmm. with my younger sister, mm -hmm. and uh, that was kind of interesting. I yeah. didn't think they would make it. Oh, that's my nice. father had never been that far away from Elmira. Right, here they drove New York country. City, you know, is about the most he's Sure, because you're talking California. Alameda, you're talking yeah. not only California, but, you know, you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, how he found it, I still don't know to this oh, day. But that was uh, nice, I, I remember, you know, looking out at the dock, and there they were. And oh. I thought, Jesus, I don't know how that happened, but Isn't it did. That nice, yeah. You know, and then gives you a real good feeling too. Right. Then yeah. we we we, uh, you know, we drove down to Southern California, uh -huh. and I have a cousin out there that mm -hmm. we visited. Oh, good. But uh, I was more or less familiar with Southern California also yeah. since I was now, school at San Diego. Was this the end of your enlistment, or is this just this is towards uh, the uh, the end? Yeah, the uh, the seaplane tender. And I, like I said, after after we got back, in fact, just prior to leaving uh, Okinawa to come back, uh, we had an incident where uh, a seaplane landed and hit a tin can. Now you wouldn't think that would do much, but it, at the speed at the aircraft. Uh, hit in the water, it tore a gash in the hull, and then seawater just slopped right up. And it happened to be right under an electronic closet where electronic equipment was stored, wow. and it caused it to smoke. And the uh, aircraft started filling up with the smoke. Uh, it, very little fire, if any. But I mean, it was the, landing in the water. Yeah, it was landing and on the was water. A, in the water, there was a tin right. can. There floating. was a tin can. That, that's what he, know. he thought it was. Uh, that they hit is a tin can, but yeah. it, it was enough at that speed to tear gas in the hull. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he, with the smoke filling the plane, he uh, he headed it towards the uh, beach to try and beach the aircraft, mm -hmm. so it wouldn't sink, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got close to it, and then I guess they put the fire out, and uh, it looked like they were able to, uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, sustained because it, it turned out it wasn't really all that serious. Mm -hmm. But uh, we had to tow the aircraft over to the ship, and then we had to pick it up by a uh, crane. Oh, okay. And then we put it on the ship, and then we took that back to San Diego with us. Mm -hmm. I did get to fly once in a PB P5M uh, on a special flight. Uh, I had a radar once a problem. They had a problem that they called me on. And uh, it had to do with uh, the antenna, radar antenna. Mm -hmm. When the aircraft uh, goes into a bank, the r radars usually sweep in this way. And of course, when you go into a bank, you sweep in this way. But it had what they call a downwind sector scan. So when you exceed a certain roll rate, mm -hmm. the antenna would automatically go down and then sweep down what's below you. So you don't miss it, you see, when you're, mm -hmm. when you're on your, you know, this is a good little feature. Yeah. But this screwed up on them. It wasn't working, and they wanted, you know. And uh, in fact, I think what was happening, it was down it all the time, doing this downwing scan, even when they were straight. Yeah. So they uh, called me on that one, and I, I went out, and uh, and I knew there's nothing I could do turning the radar on. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It it was straight. It would not go downwing. That's mm -hmm. what it was. And I knew there was nothing I could do, unless I could change the pitch and roll. And of course, we had nothing to simulate pitch and roll to the radar. <laughs> Nowadays, we simulate that stuff, and yeah. it's, uh, you know, it's easy. But uh, in those days, we didn't have that capability. Mm -hmm. So I, I told a, I told the crew, I said, you know, we're going to have to go up on a test hop for this. And uh, and then uh, so he, he says, well, if you think so, I'll talk to the pilot, you know. So they arranged for a test hop. In the meantime, I was searching. I was looking at the box with that circuit was located 
And I noticed that the fan was not installed, the fan blower, the blower motor. Mm -hmm. Then I decided I won't say anything. <laughs> You know, as long as they're always going through, make, you know, I love to fly, right? Yeah. So as long as they're going through the uh, the motions, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, set up a flight, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I'll, uh, I'll go along with it. So basically, I would like to see that myself, you know, that with that problem. Pretty much, oh, okay. So uh, we, we, we did, pilot came out and we got in, took, got airborne, it was just an hour, you know. Yeah. But, uh, and, and it, I, I went back there and, uh, I was at the radar, and yeah, sure enough, uh, it, it wouldn't go into that mode. Mm -hmm. And of course, there was nothing I could do at the box. So I said, "Okay, I think I know what the problem is." I didn't tell them, you know. So we landed, and when I got back uh, to the ship, I I brought that unit back to the sh back to the ship with me, and then gave me gave them my mm -hmm. unit with a blower in it. Yeah, and that's and, what it uh, and that's, what, that's all it really needed yeah. was a blower. You know, somebody forgot to install it or put the wrong box in. Yeah. And that's what caused it. At least I got an hour flight out. Yeah, what the heck, you know? <laughs> that, it was great. Yeah, it was if good. you didn't do that stuff, you wouldn't normally get the chance to fly. Sure, sure. And I, it was funny. Uh, one time I, I, I fixed the radar and I was waiting for the boat to come pick me up. We were floating there in the water. Mm -hmm. And I had the, the, the side door open. Because you're only about uh, a foot or so off the water. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting on a step, uh, you know, just kind of you know, waiting, and then I see this little commotion in the water underneath the wing, from not near the wing tip, and it's a little, it's a snake, you know. Oh my gosh. And it was swimming over, you know. It's pretty, a pretty little thing. And and this is uh, in the ocean. Yeah, and yeah. he, you know, he came right up, and he looks right up, and then he starts swimming down towards the front of the plane. And it was black and white stripes. And I thought, yeah, it's a pretty snake, you know. I was almost going to Mm -hmm. Pick it up, but I didn't. And uh, later I found out it's what they call a sea snake, uh -huh. which is probably one of the most poisonous, poisonous snakes that yeah. you can find. It's a good thing you didn't pick it up. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I, uh, uh, a Navy pilot that I met uh, in my career later uh, said that I told him that story. Mm -hmm. He said that uh, he in Korea he had. Uh, he was flying Corsairs for a different squadron, uh, and he got shot down and uh, off of uh, the uh, Incheon, uh, mm -hmm. which is up northern uh, uh, yeah. South Korea, which yeah. is near the border. And he got shot down and uh, he ended up in the water, and he said, there was a, when he got underwater, there was a bunch of snakes, and he said, he said, they were just Ooh. thrashing to keep him away from them. Wow. And, uh, but didn't think anything about it. So he got back to... Uh, uh, back to the ship, and uh, his, his carrier, and then uh, looked it up in a <laughs> in a in a book. Yes. Yeah. It, it said they were sea snakes, you know. Mm -hmm. So he had a close call with them, you know. Wow. But he, fortunately, nothing happened to him. Yeah, fortunately. But that that that's that's bad stuff. Yeah. Bad stuff. So anyhow, I, I kind of, uh, when we got back to the States, there was a very little to do until uh, I could, I'd get off the ship. Mm -hmm. They were getting ready to go back over again because of, uh, you know, supporting. Uh, I should mention one thing. Uh, you talk about war. Uh, at the time, uh, you remember shortly after the uh, the China, you know, the Taiwan government set up in Formosa, you know, mm -hmm. Chiang Kai-shek. Mm -hmm. He took his uh, he took his people uh, to uh, to to Formosa because they get away from the communists mm -hmm. and establish that as being China, the real China. Of course, we still have a problem today. But uh, there was they also owned uh, two islands off the coast, very close to the coast of China. One was called Amoy and the other one was called Quimoy. And that was uh, that was uh, you know under control of Chiang Kai-shek and uh, the Chinese communists were trying to get them out of there. And so they would do a lot of the shelling. They'd start shelling that island, you know, mm -hmm. from uh, from their, uh, uh, from, the from the coast, from the mm -hmm. mainland. And we had uh, a lot of activity, you know, with, with the ships. We had a lot of stepped up activity with our patrols and uh, with uh, 
with uh, other other ships uh, to prevent any kind of an invasion, mm -hmm. uh, to, to keep them from invading. So we had a presence, a military presence there, mm -hmm. which I think uh, caused them to uh, think twice about doing anything like that. And then uh, when they finally, uh, well, during that action, we a lot of those ships ended up at uh, Okinawa, where we were. And let me tell you, I've never seen so many ships in uh, a port that I have that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were big ships, cruisers, they were uh, transports, they were all, all kinds of uh, ships that, uh, you know, you rarely see together in one position. And so, that was some pretty critical times, uh, the shelling of Amoy and Krim Krimoy. Mm -hmm. You know, nowadays people don't even know or even heard of it, but right. uh, in those yeah, days that was a very, very critical uh, period in uh, relations between, uh, you know, China mm -hmm. and uh, Formosa and Taiwan. Formosa, Taiwan, and and uh, the U.S. for that matter, because we were kind of involved, although we you know standoffish, mm -hmm. but we were there in case anything uh, you know erupted, mm -hmm. and uh, we, so we had a large military presence at that time. So I'm sure a lot of people, uh, you know, that were involved, you know, remember it, but not, not, it, it's not uh, it doesn't rank high in history in right. historical moments. But then I don't think the Korean War does either. You know, except now we're starting to, you yeah. know, get back into it again. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. So how much longer did you have then? What were I, uh, you doing now until you were um, discharged from the... I, uh, well, we got back in February, March, and then I think I got off the ship in uh, early June, the mm -hmm. end of May, early June. Mm -hmm. They, uh, I was a second class by then, uh, mm -hmm. second class petty officer. And, I, you know, being in a rate that I had, uh, AT, the aviation electronics technician was a rate that they really needed. And uh, so if you took the test and passed it, you pretty much, you know, for uh, for advancement in grade, you pretty much got it. Mm -hmm. And and that's what happened to me. I got second class on my third year. And then I took the test for first class. And uh, and I and I passed it. And they, and they, what, the trouble is, in uh, June of 55, uh, prior to June of 55, they decided to change the rules. Uh, rather than give it to me when I normally would have gotten it, and I would have gotten out as first class. Mm -hmm. uh, a slick arm first class, at least, because they wouldn't have any, you know, service stripes. You have to have a four years <laughs> to get your service stripe. I would have been what they call a slick arm first class, except that uh, to entice me to go in or entice anybody that, that made it to uh, to get that rate, mm -hmm. you had to ship over. Mm -hmm. Because they said, uh, I was supposed to get out in June, they said well, we're making an effective July 1st. Well, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you do the math and uh, that's two weeks after I'm supposed to be a civilian, you know. And I'll be darned if, uh, if that's, I mean, if you made me an ensign, I might consider it, but not, not mm -hmm. a, you know, I, I You'd have to enlist You'd have, for another two I'd years or something? I'd have to ship over for four years, you see. Four years? Yeah, wow. in order to... Uh, to get that rate. In order to get that rate, and mm -hmm. I just didn't think it was worth it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I had, I'd seen one of each, you know, and I uh, enjoyed uh, what I did, and, right. you know, why spoil a good thing, you know? Yeah. That's why mm -hmm. I'm left with happy memories. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But uh, computers... I mean, you knew then you didn't want to be a career... No, the only thing that I maybe. thought I thought about was that uh, they were coming out with a computer technician for the first time. It was mm -hmm. The rating was called EQ, this is and it was for a computer 55? technician. Huh? 1955? Yes, yeah. as a matter of fact. Okay. Now remember, uh, transistors were just uh, just being invented yeah. uh, from Bell Telephone Labs. I think 1954, mm -hmm. uh, William Shockley invented a transistor. And uh, in '55, uh, you know, you hardly saw any evidence of it, but yeah. uh, you know that it, it was there. Yeah. You didn't know what it was good for at the time, but you knew it was there. Yeah. And because uh, they were very simple devices then. And <clears throat> so I thought about the computer thing, and I said, "No, nah, you know, I could probably do as well outside." <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and I did want to go to school. So what I did was to uh, decide to turn it all down, and I, I took my I took my mustering out pay about 300 bucks or more and uh, headed back to Elmira. Mm -hmm. But before I did, there was this girl I knew in Santa Monica in Southern California because mm -hmm. I, I was mustered out at uh, Treasure Island in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, I decided that I was going to go down and see her, spend a couple of days with her, and her, she lived with her mother, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then head back to Elmira, because I kind of promised her I'd do that. So I did. And it was really nothing romantic or anything, and I don't know why I even did it. Mm -hmm. But uh, to show you what uh, little things that your whole career can change. Mm -hmm. That was, a, at the time, I didn't realize what was happening. Uh, I didn't know anything about school. I didn't know where I was going to go. I didn't even know if I could qualify, you know, but I did. I knew I wanted you, to go to college. You didn't want to go back to Alfred? Cause I wasn't even thinking of Alfred. I was thinking of other yeah, places. Other. And uh, so when I visited her in Santa Monica, she, she uh, won the, the next day she had to go to Santa Monica City College and sign up to register because she was taking a course. So she said, you want to go with me? And I said, sure. And so I said, uh, by the way, what's the cost to go here? And she said, $7. And I said, no, no, I mean, what's the tuition? $7. <laughs> now, I'm used to, you know, back east, well, yeah. of course, Alfred in 50 only cost me 80 as I recall. Yeah. But this was $7. But she said, of course, you got to buy your own books, you know. So I said, you mean to tell me that... $7 uh, for a course? One course? Yeah, for a semester. Wow. No, three or four courses. They, You're they don't, kidding. $7 is what the... She has a community college, okay? Yeah. yeah. So uh, I immediately, I immediately asked the gal at the desk, I said, can I qualify to come here? And she said, well, uh, do you have a transcript of your records? I said, no, but uh, I went to Elmer, you know, Academy, and, uh, you know, there's the address, and... I went to Alfred, uh, which, see, Alfred at that time, it's, it's Alfred State University now. Mm -hmm. But in th those days, it was known as the New York State Agricultural and Technical Institute. Okay, yeah, yeah. It became yeah. Alfred University, yeah. or Alfred State. Yeah. And uh, so I gave her the mm -hmm. address, and uh, they said, well, we'll send away for the transcripts, and then uh, in the fall, you'd come and register. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that I was going to go back to California. Now, did you have... It, um were you eligible f for the GI Bill? Was yeah, that? Yeah, you were. Yeah, okay. So you could. I never used it. Really? No, I never told them to use it. Oh my gosh! And and uh, and I'll tell you why. Wow. Uh, because what I wanted to do is is uh, I went back to Elmira for the summer, mm -hmm. and uh, I got a job. Uh, I went. I was looking for a job out there for the summer, so I, I uh, went to Westinghouse. It was big in those days, mm -hmm. in '55. And, uh, of course, with my background, I said, sure, we can take it right now, you know. I said, good. Uh, I said, uh, but I only, only want to stay here until September. You know, tell me. I didn't know, you know, me and my big mouth. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, wait a minute, this is a permanent position. <laughs> I said, yeah, but I, I plan on going to school. You know? Back in California. And they said, well, sorry, we can't hurry. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I ended up uh, working on construction oh, with Del okay. Ripple. <laughs> no kidding. Doing 352. Yes. <laughs> You know, for the summer, and then uh, and yeah. then I went. I drove Sounds out at uh, Labor Ohio. Day. Uh, Labor Day headed for uh, Santa Monica. Yeah. I didn't know where I was gonna. You know, I mean, the, my girlfriend got me this room. You know, a private room for like eleven dollars a week. Mm -hmm. And then I uh, decided to look for a job, and uh, part time, and go to school mm -hmm. full time. Uh -huh. So I signed so up. You knew about the GI Bill, but you just never. I never thought it never dawned on me. Oh, you know, wow. yeah, I didn't even know what they paid, but I, I wanted to work anyhow. So yeah. uh, I, uh, when I was at, back in Elmira, she sent me some LA papers so I could look for jobs. Yeah. And there was one job that I saw that was called. They were looking at Lit Litton, Litton Industries was looking for a technician. And it was in Beverly Hills. Well, I knew where Beverly Hills was. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that's the one I, I kept. I, I sent them a letter, but I don't think I ever got an answer back. But anyhow, when I went back to California, I registered for full time, mm -hmm. and then uh, I, I, you know, in the meantime, I tried to find a part time job. I couldn't do it, but everybody was willing to hire me, you know, because my my military background. Sure. Uh, Hughes Hughes Aircraft. Hello, we'll start you off at equivalent to a junior engineer. Wow. Just just say you'll come. Yeah. And I said, no, I, I don't want to work full-time, I want to work part-time. Because you wanted to go to school? Yeah, I want to go full-time, school. school. And then uh, I went to uh, Lytton, and uh, the first job, it's a good thing I didn't take that one because they had a different job in mind for me, it was a technician mm -hmm. testing. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, the very next day I decided I, I'm not going to be able to work, uh, you know, part time. So I'll just reverse it. I'll go to school nights and I'll and I'll work days. So I, I I changed my my schedule at school, and then instead of going back to Hughes and all that, I went the first place I went to was Lytton, and this time I I got uh, I got a development lab engineer, uh, you know, Forsen, mm -hmm. and one of the most sharpest engineers I think I'd ever met, uh, and he he very much influenced my career, yeah. and. Uh, and I, I went to work for him. At, uh, he asked me, how much do you want? And I said, a buck eighty, because that's what I got in construction, an hour. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and he was trying to tell me, you know, we'll give you, we'll give you more, we'll give you more. But he yeah. couldn't, uh, and I honestly uh, oh, tell me. Yeah. You know, and so then later, hit, hit I, I didn't know, you know. Sure, yeah. I mean, gee, a great job. And I was working in a lab. Yeah. And we were working with transistors in 1955 and memory drums. I was working on computer circuits. Mm -hmm. And this is in the you know 1955. I was uh, helping them design, and I was learning how to how to you know uh, breadboard and test, mm -hmm. and then make minor corrections you know mm -hmm. based on what he it was teaching me. Mm -hmm. So that was a tremendous tremendous experience. And that uh, memory drum, which became the heart of the memory, now they're hard drives. But mm -hmm. in that in those days they were they were rotating drums with contact heads on them. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I mean one big assembly. We could we could probably have more uh, more memory in a in a small calculator than mm -hmm. we than we had in that whole yeah. that whole assembly. But we're talking 1955, sure, sure. where that that drum later became the basic uh, part of a weapon system that Lytton built for the A6 Intruder, yeah. in which I joined that out. You know, I, I joined field engineering in 1960 mm -hmm. or 59 when my father was uh, got ill with cancer, mm -hmm. and somebody told me that. Uh, if you want to be near New York, uh, Lytton was going to be sending people out to Grumman, you know, on oh, Long okay. Island. Long Island. So yeah. that's when I became a field engineer. Oh, okay. And that background that I had in the lab served me very well. You know, I mean, you could see the uh, the progression from sure, the Navy. From, from the Navy and they yeah. hired me in Lytton because of my background in pulse circuits, which mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you look at a when you look at a, a computer circuits like flip flops. We're dealing with pulses, mm -hmm. and uh, so they wanted somebody that had uh, a lot of radar background. So that's what set me up uh, with, uh, you know, Lytton. And then, then from uh, there, I, I went in, you know, after about, I was still going to school nights uh, through all that time, mm -hmm. and taking pre-engineering courses. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of that, the most prolific time of my life was uh, working at a place like Lytton in a development lab where. At nighttime, you're learning. You're taking physics and calculus, and the physics that you're learning can you can be applicable. It, 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 it works. In the, in the it works. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. we were working with barium titanate. We were working on integrated circuits in the late 50s. Yeah. Now we went from transistors to integrated circuits. We had a contract yeah. with, the, with the government to uh, to uh, develop integrated circuits. Yeah. You know, and in we I tested the first one we ever built. Uh, it was a triumvirate. Three companies: uh, Texas Instruments, Servo. No, yeah, Texas Instruments, Servo Mechanisms, and uh, Lytton was a three-company uh, project. First calculator I ever had got from Texas Instruments. Right, right. <laughs> but they they had built uh, using a barium titanate as a substrate, uh, mm -hmm. something to put it on. They deposited uh, uh, resi you know silver nichrome on on this disc and that became a resistor. How much you put on, how thick mm -hmm. it was, mm -hmm. was how much resistance it was. The, the capacitor using the barium titanate as a, uh, uh, you know, the substrate is a dielectric uh, with a plate on the top and a plate mm -hmm. on the bottom. It was a capacitor. The transistor we couldn't do anything with in 57, 58, so we took the transistor out of a can, put it on a, <laughs> put it on a substrate, doped it up so that the air wouldn't get to it. And then connected it, so we had a we had a, a, a flip flop the size of a quarter, oh, wow. and uh, and I, I I was doing the testing on, uh, and I had to use a microscope actually to see the connections to make sure the connections sure. were, sure. but that was some of the first integrated circuits we had worked on, yeah. and uh, of course they developed and then memory memory systems also we right. you know, we worked on advanced memory. So you can you can go back to your training in your navy Absolutely. and just see how everything right. just built and built and built. 
Right. And then you were able to carry it right into your civilian life. That's right. With the education so plus the opportunity. I was invaluable. Had. The military experience was <coughs> invaluable because without that I would not have gotten the opportunity I did when mm -hmm. I got out. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, California in those days uh, was heavy on aerospace. And companies like Linton, uh, Libriscope, uh, TRW mm -hmm. uh, were just starting up in, in mm -hmm. the late 50s. And uh, these companies, uh, Hughes Aircraft, they're mm -hmm. all hiring like mad. Yeah. And they had contracts called cost plus fixed fee, which means uh, the government paid you <laughs> you know, to do a job. Mm -hmm. And you didn't have to, I mean, you, you still made your money. It's mm -hmm. not a fixed price contract. Oh. Fixed price contract means, you know, you got to hire all these people, but you can't hire too many because you're not going to make a profit. Mm -hmm. But here you can hire as many as you want and still and get 10% profit, profit, you see. Yeah. So this cost plus fixed fee to me, it built up that aerospace industry in the, in the late 50s. Yeah. And uh, it was a big boom on, you know. Yeah. Litton was started by a guy, Tex Thornton, uh, who, who left Hughes at the same time that, uh, uh, you know, several other people, Roy Ash, he actually worked at Lytton, mm -hmm. he became a budget advisor to President Nixon. Uh, I used to use his car to go get parts, you know, and, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, run in yeah. L.A. and get to an electronic store sure. and get parts and bring it back to Lytton. Uh, Tex Thornton, uh, there was a company, uh, a guy named Ramo and another guy named Woldridge that uh, formed a company called Ramo Woldridge. And then eventually it was bought by a company called Thompson Products, which uh, later became Thompson Ramo Woldridge, and then he shortened that to TRW, okay. and everybody knew that. But these guys left the Hughes all at the same time yeah. in 1954. Yeah. There was a whole bunch of these executives that left and started these companies yeah. that became, uh, you know, world corporations. Sure. So you can see the uh, the impact. You know, right. being there at that time was the right the right, right. place to be. Yeah, so it's a good thing you went to see that. Had I not that, gone to see that girl, which yeah. again there was no romance involved, you know, yeah. I, I probably would be in Elmar and look at you know repairing TVs or you know whatever yeah. it is that you do. Yeah. Or maybe at uh, Westinghouse for 25 yeah. years and then being thrown out. You just happened out. to go to the community college with her. Yeah. And then you That's just got right. interested in, in in taking right. those courses that you needed. And that that uh, you know served me. I think I spent. Uh, 14 years with Grumman, or with Litton, and mm -hmm. then uh, I had an offer from Grumman when, mm -hmm. he, when he first got the F-14 contract with the Navy. Mm -hmm. And it uh, turns out that Grumman wanted me to go work for them, because I had spent two years at Grumman on the E-6 Intruder in the early 60s, right. You're going through flight test and development. Right. And, uh, so then you worked for Grumman out in Long Island? I worked, at, no, in, actually in Point Magoo in California. In California, okay. That's where the uh, avionics uh, aircraft, the F-14 was uh, flight tested, mm -hmm. and, and I was very heavily involved with that. Mm -hmm. So uh, That's pretty exciting. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, it, it was. A very. I, I owe it all to the Navy. I mm -hmm. really do. Mm -hmm. I mean, had I, and, and really when I, when I think about Alfred here, if I hadn't gone to that yeah. That one year, I don't know if I would have qualified to become a technician. That uh, gave me the training, to gave me the uh, you know the opening right. to go to go where I where I've been. Right. You know? right. So it uh, it just uh, everything worked out just just yeah. right. That's great. And and I, I really you know when you look back, I, I owe that uh, really to the Navy. Mm -hmm. You know the the training that set me up for it. Mm -hmm. So you have you have no regrets about going into no, the Navy, I, then it's just... I spent uh, 11 yeah. years with Grumman, and then I left and I went to two or three companies, including Teledyne. Mm -hmm. And then finally I was downsized, because uh, I came from a different Teledyne, from one Teledyne division to another. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they would have periodic layoffs, and they were, they were laying off the people who came from this other division mm -hmm. <laughs> to keep their own, you know, and mm -hmm. I got caught up in that. Yeah. And, uh, that's when I ended up back in Elmira, uh, oh. ten, 10 years ago, working for EBB Traction oh, okay. in the rail business. Yeah. And I'm still in the rail business today. Good. And a lot of the training, even then, uh, that I'd gotten into, uh, you know, is a, in engineering, uh, you know, it's a different world, the rail, the rail business, but basically, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, got it's not an airframe, but it's a shell. It's yeah. got the uh, cabling. It's got systems. And sure. It, you know, sure. It's not that difficult of a transition. Yeah, you carry over there. Right. And, and somewhere. It's just yeah. that the train is not going to go down in a track and then take yeah. off. And, yeah. You know, yeah. You'd be lucky if it stays on the track. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
So it, it uh, it's been a it's been a good career, and I, I yeah. think I really owe it all to the military yeah. experience that I had. Great. Um, is there any? Can you think of anything else that might have occurred that you haven't included in our our little conversation here? You, seems like you've covered well, it all pretty much. And yeah, I probably uh, encapsulated <coughs> it. Yeah. A lot of exciting times, you know, uh, the F-14. In fact, uh, the uh, National Warplane Museum has an F-14 mm -hmm. that they brought up from Oceana. Yeah. And, now, uh, are, you, are you involved with the National yeah, Warplane I, Museum? Yeah, I uh, volunteered because yes. I, I, you know, as a tour guide yes. and, uh, recently. And right. uh, the, uh, I like it because uh, they got a B-17. Of uh, course, that was one thing I didn't mention. When I got out of the Navy, uh, I went to, as I said, I went to Lytton. I was there three months and then had to come back to Elmar for a, my father having an operation. And then mm -hmm. shortly after that, rather than go back to California, I, uh, I went to Dayton where I had a girlfriend. And uh, I, I lived there for about seven months. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we got married and I headed back to California. Mm -hmm. That was in 56. And uh, during that time, uh, I was working at Wright-Patterson. And I got a job as a flight test technician, flying in B-17s. Wow. So I got uh, I got about 52 hours flying time in the B-17, mm -hmm. 45 minutes of stick time. And mm -hmm. the guy let me sit in the cockpit finally and get mm -hmm. to fly. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I did get uh, I did get that uh, opportunity. Right. Well, it's nice that you can volunteer with the National War Museum. Yeah, I, I enjoy it and uh, you know you get a bunch of people there, particularly when you get to the B-17 or you know mm -hmm. some of the aircraft I can identify with and you can right. launch into stories. And then when yeah. you get to the F-14. Yeah. See they have a TBM there, uh, TBF, uh, inside the display. It's mm -hmm. a very big Grumman airplane. It's mm -hmm. a tor it was a torpedo bomber during World War II and then uh, uh, they converted it to anti-submarine warfare, and they put the heavy radar on it. Mm -hmm. That's the one I flew in uh, my first flight off the carrier. Yeah, and, the carrier. Uh, yeah. We, we dinged up and had to throw it over. <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, you got stories there, you got stories of the B-17, and then with the sure. F-14, uh, you know, you can relate stories about yeah. how the first time the gun fired and, uh, you know, it. Uh, the engine, left engine flamed out because yeah. it ingested all these gases and what we had to do mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, you're an excellent resource for it. Yeah, and I spent a lot of time on aircraft carriers. I was a team leader for the inertia navigation system. That was built by Lit, and I was mm -hmm. very familiar with the inertia system. So mm -hmm. that, was, that along with the uh, Phoenix weapon system in the F-14 was my mm -hmm. area of expertise. Mm -hmm. And we had it, but uh, the trip support carrier was to develop the capability for the airplane to get in alignment with the gyros and on land it's not that bad of a problem because they're fixed you know land doesn't mm -hmm. move but when you're on an aircraft carrier when you've got pitch roll and you know azimuth or yaw you have to uh, it's a little different situation of trying to convince the system that you're really rock solid when you're moving all over the place right, right. and uh, you know there's, there's a simple way of doing that uh, using the ship's inertial navigation system yeah. and we plug that into the side of the airplane mm -hmm. but uh, you need software to develop all that you know develop the algorithms to do all that right, and right. that was our problem you know mm -hmm. is, is perfecting the software yeah. to uh, make sure that uh, you know, they read it correctly and responded correctly and the right. system responded correctly. So we had three or four, uh, three or four of those uh, uh, carrier trips. Yeah. Enterprise. Uh, one uh, story, uh, I worked with people who later became astronauts. Mm -hmm. uh, one was Dale Gardner, he was a mission control specialist. Mm -hmm. The other one was uh, Richard Houck, uh, we call him Rick. He, uh, he was at Patuxent River uh, at the Naval Air Test Center. We used one of their F-14s uh, mm -hmm. because they're flyable. Ours at Point Magoo were not able to land on the carrier deck because mm -hmm. they didn't have the modifications for the mm -hmm. tail hook. But so we used the Patuxent River F-14s to do our system development. And uh, we were on the forest though once, I think it was like November of 72, off Norfolk, Virginia. and. Uh, he was on a catapult and went through a couple of things and finally he revved up the engines and they signaled to go. Well, he forgot to release his parking brake. And what had happened was that the aircraft got airborne. 
they left two black streaks going down. All the way down. <laughs> oh, that was funny. You have any tires left? Blew, blew both tires. So how did he land? Well, he very carefully. Very he, carefully? <laughs> he, he had to dump the fuel and come back in. Oh, wow. And, uh, and then, you know, he, they surmised that the tires are... Did they have to foam up the deck or something for no, him to no, land? No, or, no, you know, no, just, he would not do that. Yeah. Uh, no, he, he, made a, he made a very good approach and he took two wires instead of one. <laughs> yeah. I think it was three or four <laughs> wires he took and uh, stopped them. Wow. So, Yes. It uh, didn't do much damage beyond that. Yeah. But, uh, did, um, he, he later became a shuttle commander, yeah. as a matter of fact. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, did you work with any flight simulators at all? No, I, uh, I, I got involved with the A6 simulator, uh, only from a Litton point of view, okay. of giving them inputs. Yeah. But I never, never worked with one. I never yeah. had the opportunity to sit in one. Yeah, uh, we had I only ask because with your electronics and yeah. and, and uh, I have a brother that works locomotive for, simulators. for Link, Link Aviation. Well, now you, you know. see, uh, locomotive engine. Uh, 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 when I when I went to ABB uh, mm -hmm. in '93, mm -hmm. they had a contract with SEPTA to build a SEPTA uh, rail car, mm -hmm. and one of the things they needed to get was that to develop mm -hmm. ABB was to develop a, uh, a locomotive simulator or okay. a train simulator. Yeah. Well, they thought it was something you'd buy off the shelf. Yeah. And when I got there, I said, no, because I worked for a company called Dynamic Sciences who developed a rare a locomotive simulator for the Association of American Railroads. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and so I was very familiar with the rail simulators. And it was, as I said, it was called a Dynamic Sciences. And so when we... Uh, 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 we had to look at two or three companies that wanted to, you know, supply it. Mm -hmm. Link was one of them. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, what does Link know about uh, locomotives? I mean, they're great in airplanes, mm -hmm. but the locomotive is a little different situation. You right. got to have you got to have some smarts on the software. Right. See, you know, based on what I learned in in 1980, 81, 82, right. you know, with dynamic sciences, and mm -hmm. uh, so I wasn't too hot on them. ITRI was another one, Illinois Institute of Technical Research uh, in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Now they had, uh, we had delivered our uh, ma major simulator, which is on a motion base, to ITRI. And they, they developed and went into the business, you know, based on what Dynamic Sciences mm -hmm. provided them under contract with the uh, mm -hmm. Association of American Railroad. So they were in the business, so they were bidding. And, uh, and then a, a company called Union Switch and Signal out of Pittsburgh, uh, they were bidding on it, so they had three bidders for this thing. Mm -hmm. It was my job to see who, you know, to recommend who to who to go to. Oh. Well, Link, I figured they're number three. You know, what do they know about trains? Mm -hmm. Itri, I didn't like them because of, because of the engineering guy. You know, used mm -hmm. to you know used to rattle me. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and so I was looking at USNS, and then I found out USNS had bought Dynamic Sciences hardware and software capability. Kind of so far as I was concerned, USNS was number one. Yeah. Well, before we even got a chance to visit them, they announced publicly that they were going out of the simulator business. Oh. So guess who buys it? Link. Oh. <laughs> so I, I went to Binghamton once and I said, you know, oh. I, I, I got to tell you guys, I said, you've gone from number three to, to number one yeah. in my estimation because yeah. I'm very familiar with this yeah. capability you just yeah. purchased. And yeah. it turned out that... Uh, they were not only had the technology that I was looking for, but they also had the price that was lower than Itri. Oh, so, good. so good. I was able to show yeah. it in Itri's well, face. I only brought, I only brought that up because I just from my But Link, no, Link, Link did build it, and, yeah. and that right now is in uh, Philadelphia. Yeah. Uh, be, you know, hopefully being still used. So Link did build a railroad simulator, but they were very big. While I was there, we used to go sit in. The, they had a DC-10 cockpit. Uh, mm -hmm. That was great. Uh, you know, sitting yeah. there. No, I, I love those simulators, but yeah. I never had that much to do with yeah. other than the locomotive simulator. Sure. Great. Well, you've had so. quite a quite a background. And yeah, I enjoyed quite it. Quite a career. I enjoyed it. Still, you know? still at it. Uh, one of these Good. days, I may think of getting out of this uh, eight to five. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe going to consulting and sure. controlling my uh, my own hours. Sure. Uh, that's what I'm sure. looking at now. Good. Good. But uh, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Well, um, before we wrap it up, do you have uh, 
just one more opportunity if you have any other comments about your military experience. I think you've made it quite clear, though, that uh, your yeah, training was yeah. just excellent and it set yeah. you on the road for right. a and lifelong I, career. I think uh, I, I think everybody, uh, I, not everybody, I don't think it's for everybody, but uh, if somebody's not getting what they really think they should be getting out of life, uh, and you got any kind of capability whatsoever, Mm -hmm. I think that the military can expand that, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and again, I'm kind of selfish because uh, you know working with the Navy uh, mm -hmm. and being in the Navy, I, I worked with the Navy over 20 years uh, after I got out, and uh, and I, I still think it's the uh, the service is built on tradition. You know, there's mm -hmm. a reason why your bell bottom trousers are bell bottom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a reason for the uh, the jumper. There's a reason for everything. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a background. There's a history. You mm -hmm. know, and uh, it's interesting. Uh, you know, if you can, uh, can if you can, like that sort of thing. Can, can you? I'm just and I am kind of interested. I've heard some stories, but can you elaborate why the bell bottoms are? Bell it's easy to slip and... off. It's easy to slip off in case you got to go overboard. You slip okay. your trousers off, and then if you tie the uh, you tie the bottoms, and that yeah. Okay. And then you can go down, and it becomes, a, a, you know, a, if you can't get to a life vest, okay. uh, it can become a life vest by just closing the bottom. Oh, okay. And, and maybe if you've got a belt to tie it, and uh, then you can use that as, I don't know, that's, that's, the, that's the official, yeah, sure. whether, whether I would ever want to try that or not. Right. I think I'd go, I'd go searching for a life vest right. yeah. <laughs> before yeah. I, I, I went to that. Yeah. That, to me, would be the last resort. Yeah. But that's uh, that's basically what it is. Yeah. Easy to get off, you know, mm -hmm. slip off your with your shoes on. Sure. Yeah, because they but, they like you to have your shoes on when you go in. Okay. And uh, the uh, the stripes are significant. Uh, you know, uh, don't ask me what I forgot. Okay. <laughs> but uh, it's based on tradition too. Even yeah. your uh, your the, the words they use, uh, you know, and you get used to this uh, on a ship, uh, even when you're not on a ship, you know, you don't go up the stairs on a ship. Anybody ever say if they go up the stairs, you know, you're going to club them over the head, it just mm -hmm. rubs you the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Stairs are a ladder, you know. Okay. The walls are bulkheads. The ceilings is an overhead. Okay. The floor is a deck, you know. Okay. You got, uh, you know, uh, you got aft, you got forward, you got right uh, for starboard and uh, port for left. Yeah. And, and you, 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 you got a whole vocabulary, a new vocabulary. You pretty much got that in and the first two weeks. Yeah. Right. And it's self yeah. And when you're on a ship, uh, any other word is foreign. You never right. say a wall. What's on the wall there? Yeah. It's the a bulkhead. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the door is a hatch. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it, it's uh, it's a really a neat uh, service. Sure. I think. sure. And uh, it's, it's very traditional. Very traditional. If the yeah. smoking lamp is out throughout the ship, you know, I, I never saw a smoking lamp, but, uh, you know, the, the old days they used to have one, okay. you know. The uh, scuttlebutt is a drinking fountain, and, oh, okay. uh, and they used to uh, gather around the uh, drinking fountain and shoot the latest rumors, and that's so where the word scuttlebutt, scuttlebutt came from. Yeah. Oh, What's sweet. the latest scuttlebutt? Yeah, that's neat. So uh, everything is traditional, you know. Yeah. They have great schools. And uh, you know, if you can qualify to get into schools, I think uh, I think you would end up uh, for a four-year investment in your time. You've not only had the time of your life, you know, if you're lucky to get on a ship that goes overseas, particularly to the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. uh, where you got exotic ports. Well, even in the Far East, they got exotic ports. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's uh, it's an experience uh, I think you'll always live with and and uh, enjoy. It. Okay. So, yeah. and who knows, it could you know. Be the breeding ground for a, an engineer, uh, or for uh, oh, certainly. for any any kind of a field that you uh, want to certainly. get into. Yeah. So I would Great. highly recommend it. Great. You know, unless somebody's got a clear path of where they're going, how to get there. Mm -hmm. But uh, for a lot of people, I think uh, I think that would uh, shape up their lives like they've never right. seen it before. Right. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, I would I heartily recommend it, even nowadays. Because yeah. I see those traditions still there. You know, I really do. Mm -hmm. I worked with, uh, well, as I said, I was a field engineer in Oceana and Virginia uh, mm -hmm. on the A6 program during the Vietnam days. Mm -hmm. Guys I know are going over and not coming back. You know, guys I used to go to the happy hour with and mm -hmm. have drinks. But 
-hmm. We had a reunion now for the intruder about a year ago. Oh, and okay. We went down and some of those guys I haven't seen in 30, 35 years. Oh, wonderful. And uh, it's really, really uh, neat. You had a good time, did you? Oh, very yeah. good, yeah. Great. That's great. In fact, they just started an F-14 Tomcat Association. They just joined. That's good. out of the West Coast. Good. But the, the aircraft's still flying, so, uh, you know, and I hope, hope it's going to be flying. It's one of our best aircraft, I think. Great. So, yeah, I, as I said, I owe everything to that military experience. Wonderful. So. Well, Bob, I'd like to thank you very oh, much for pleasure. being willing to spend the time and let us record your your uh, experiences. Well, I so. appreciate the opportunity. Good, so, good. Anyway. And like you say, if you have any more pictures, that if you want to put them together, like you yeah. say, you can print them out. Okay. And then um, before I leave, I'll give you the address for the uh, Historical Society. Um, and okay. then I'll make sure that they know that you're going to yeah. send some photos along. Okay. Okay? Do. Very good. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Let's see if I can get this.